From KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. And welcome to this Newsmakers Extra. We're talking with Dr. Vivian Ho from the Baker Institute of Public Policy. You have been studying health care issues for quite some time. Has it ever been as unstable as it seems to be now, has the potential to be right now? We have never been so uncertain. I've been doing this for more than 20 years and, and no one knows what is going to happen in January. This whole process now, the instability now, what's going on here. I've read that Texas already has uh, a high number of uninsured and now with the changes that potentially could take place, those numbers could go down even more so. The fact that Texas did not expand its Medicaid uh, coverage, how big of an impact has that had on all of what we're doing in the state of Texas as far as health care? Well, we could probably have covered an additional one million Texans if Texas had chosen to expand Medicaid under Obamacare. Um, the, there's, there's a philosophical belief by many of our political leaders here in the state that you should not provide health care coverage to able-bodied adults. However, there is not a realization that a person who is living at the minimum wage, who's working full time, is not able to afford to buy health insurance. Um, and, and so that's the challenge. If, if we want to have a productive, healthy workforce, there has to be some additional investment. This was a rational, very rational decision. We should have participated is what I'm saying, because by business sense, this is getting um, federal tax dollars. It would have cost the, the, the Texas taxpayer extremely little. This would have been um, a terrific in terms of getting federal tax dollars into our economy, um, which would have had a multiplier effect. Those, those dollars would have run around in our economy and sort of um, generated more jobs and it would have provided better coverage. You know, the political uh, folks who are making those decisions, that's basically what it was, right? It was not a business decision, it was a political yes. decision on whether or not to expand Medicaid and whatnot. A lot of the, the people that I know and friends of mine as well who are conservatives think that, you know, the people like you who are in academia who study this stuff, you're liberal anyway, you're just pushing it liberal agenda and they really think that that's just what it is a liberal policy what would you say to that um, I don't uh, you know at the Baker Institute we are we do not take political sides we analyze things objectively I am perfectly willing to say there are parts of Obamacare that were too generous and that's part of the reason we ran into problems in terms of the higher premiums it's not the whole reason though mm -hmm. so um, you know, I, what I'd like to see under the next administration is to preserve the market competition that was central to Obamacare um, and, and actually uh, work on that, reduce some of the benefits that were probably too generous that we couldn't afford to pay for with taxpayer money, alter the way we reimburse um, insurance companies. There are plenty of things we could do um, to make it work more efficiently. Has someone in any level of government talked to you or other people at the Baker Institute to say, give us your analysis of what we should do. Clearly what you've done and your writings are out there for people to read. You've done these reports. So what kind of interaction have you had or has the Baker Institute had with anybody who really wants to kind of improve the Affordable Care Act? Well, well, right now all the fellows have been working on, on issue briefs for the, the Trump administration. We're planning on putting that together and um, we're working to have all of that go to Washington, D.C. and hopefully make tricks, trips to Capitol Hill to try and um, to try and have our word in terms of, of how the new policies are going to take place. So there is an effort to at least try to get that input from people who are, don't have a political dog in the hunt, so to speak, and just say this is how we think it can work. Exactly. This whole process going forward, you've done another study here that's uh, a four-year analysis of how state of Texas insured fared under the Affordable Care Act up to this point. Which sounded like, I think you said a million more were yes. insured because of the Affordable Care Act. So on the surface, I'm not quite sure how that turns out to be such a bad thing. I actually think it's, I agree with you, it's terrific. It's um, that we got more people health insurance coverage. Some people don't think that that, that, that should be covered with taxpayer money. Mm. I happen to disagree because I, I think it actually leads to better workforce productivity and it leads to, to better protections. Um, there are people who disagree that it's a redistribution of income because, well, how do you pay for um, this these higher health care expenses? But, you know, Everybody was brought to the table when the legislation was designed. So it's paid for in part by taxes on insurance companies, taxes on medical device makers, taxes on pharmaceutical companies. Some people are hearing the word tax and they're actually saying, oh no, let's get rid of the taxes. But you say, look, these are companies that are benefiting. We're actually taxing them for it. Part of it is also being paid for by taxes 
on people who choose not to purchase, purchase health insurance coverage. You said at one point that some of the things about the Affordable Care Act, they might have been providing too generous uh, in terms of payments out of, for example. So, um, so the Affordable Care Act does require the um, sort of minimum essential health benefits for all policies, okay? And, and that includes coverage, free, free coverage of many different preventive services that are recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Tax Force. We probably, um, I think in our terms of priorities, we want to make sure everyone has catastrophic coverage, and that is something that would be nice. It yields health benefits, but we can't afford it with taxpayer money right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also have limited the, um, the ratio of the premiums that can be charged to um, the oldest um, people um, relative to the youngest by three to one. In a natural market, that's five to one. I think we should consider expanding that ratio because what it will do, currently we're, we're requiring the young, youngest insurers to pay a much higher premium um, to cover older people. And uh, while I agree that's a nice sentiment, what it's doing is it's discouraging younger, healthier people, people from buying premiums. If you actually give them a lower premium, they'll come in, they'll provide some coverage. That could lower premiums for everyone in the market if we do it in the right way. I've determined from this conversation that I'm going to nominate you for the chair of something <laughs> to, to get this whole thing solved. This is great hearing from you and getting this input. It's fabulous. I appreciate you coming in. And I look forward to talking with you after you have an opportunity to go to Washington or whatever you're going to do in terms of offering the advice that you're going to offer based upon what are statistics and numbers and not emotion. True? Thank you. That's what we're aiming for, the objective analysis that makes Americans better off. Dr. Vivian Ho, thank you very much. Thank you for watching as well.